Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hello again, it has been a while. No need to discuss what exactly I've been doing for the last 12 months. We already know why I'm currently stuck inside with some more free time to talk to strangers on the internet about obscure historical footnotes. And with that in mind, today we are going to start my series on James IV of Scotland, who I've already mentioned enough times for some of you to get the picture that his story is the reason why I decided to make this YouTube channel in the first place. But as this series progresses, I think you'll see why James IV of Scotland is my favourite of all the Scottish kings, and ultimately his warrior death is probably a part of that. James IV of Scotland was Scotland's first true Renaissance king in every way except militarily, it would seem. But anyway, let's get into it. Rightfully, after teasing the English, I have been teased back and called out to make a video on the Battle of Flodden, also known as Flodden Field. As Vili Vassal pointed out, most Scots and indeed most people are ignorant of this battle and it would be a total disaster for Scotland. There's no way to sugarcoat it. I took plenty of jabs at England in the last video. I can take it. No, 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 no. It doesn't, it doesn't make me want to call Nicola and scream. Freedom! I can take it. I can take it, damn it. <clears throat> anyway, so that aside, <laughs> let's begin. The year is 1513 and the Italian Wars, also known as the Wars of the League of Cambrai, so yes, we will be sticking to calling it the Italian Wars for the sake of my sanity during the editing of this video. Because I know trying to say the War of the League of Cambrai every time is going to fuck me then, uh, Ooh, don't say it, don't say it. Then a night out in Manchester. Ooh, you said it. But I digress. France is currently not doing too well at this whole war thing, and you can go add your own jokes here, having recently sent an army over the Alps to advance on Milan, which they did succeed to do. They were, however, ended up routed by a smaller Swiss army at the Battle of Novara. They were routed so bad, in fact, that some of the Swiss pursued them beyond the mountains and as far inland as Dijon before being bribed away. England, the ever-present opportunists, took this moment of bad form and string of losses to launch an invasion, besieging Theruan. This would lead to the Battle of the Spurs, where France's bad form would continue, resulting in a disastrous loss which led to the death of many nobles and ultimately the besieging and capturing of Tournai. At the request of Louis XII of France, Scotland invaded England in an attempt to draw back some of Henry VIII of England's army from France. And here is where we begin to stop talking about France's failure during the Italian Wars, and we begin to talk about Scotland's. So back home, Henry VIII of England had declared he would be the overlord of Scots, and as you can imagine, this didn't please the Scots or their king particularly well. It also didn't help that Henry VIII was Catholic, but the Scottish Reformation is a whole different story and we haven't got time today. But really, being English alone was probably already enough if we're being totally honest. Anyway, James IV decides to invade England with a force of 30,000 and 17 various sized cannons. A good party by anyone's definition. But of course, this is the medieval period, and words like chivalry still have a meaning, and aren't just archaic dead words with no real meaning like they are in modern English. So a letter is sent one month in advance, as was standard, announcing the intention to invade. So it's safe to say they knew we were coming, and of course began to prepare for such an invasion. Scotland didn't make it far into England, only reaching as far south as Brankston in Northumberland, which is why the battle is also called the Battle of Brankston, as that is technically more accurate than the Battle of Flodden, or so I'm told. So the date is the 9th of September, 1513, and the Scottish, after having been forced onto a hill near Brankston, which will for some reason be known in history as Flodden, are in a solid position for the conflict that is about to take place. Now I think James IV is a Scottish legend, and I am biased as fuck, but even I can't blue pill the decision making behind what is about to come next. The Scots, standing above the English, looking down at them, for some reason decide to go and meet them down in the field rather than waiting for the English to try and climb up the hill in their old ass medieval shoes. The medieval Attenborough of YouTube, or more commonly known as Lindy Beige, has a couple of medieval shoes over on his channel if anyone's curious. But to say they don't look like they would grip particularly well is an understatement, I am sure. Especially when you have many men treading over the same area, tearing that ground up and making it all nice and slippy, and difficult to climb making it just right for you to fall and get bludgeoned through your skull by any array of varying war weapons which surround you in a medieval battlefield. 
So that was the first fuck up, moving down the hill and giving up that lovely advantage for England to literally slip on. But fine, that's survivable, it just means an even playing field, right? Well, yes and no, because you can't run up a hill as quickly as you came down, and once you're down, trying to go back up is literally going to cause the same repetitive treading of earth and making it all slippery as your mum's vagina and making it a fucking nightmare to get out of. Again, much like your mum's vagina. But I digress. Your mum's vagina aside, this still isn't enough on paper to cause an overwhelming defeat, all things being equal. But this is where we get to fuck up number two. Now again, James IV is a national icon, a true legend worthy of admiration in Scottish folklore, but his bravery, or perhaps lack of current medieval battlefield tactics, would ultimately cost him his life, and we can't get around that fact. That simply is our history. Our greatest king, at least in my opinion, led one of the worst military campaigns into English territory in our history, and I'll explain why. So the reason I call it brave is because I'm not James IV. I don't know his reasoning for his actions. Maybe he was militarily inept, or maybe he just simply refused to change up what he knew and had been taught. Or maybe it was also that part of every Scottish person that lays deep inside their head when faced with an English opponent in any competition is just screaming, Let's fucking go then! Over and over and over. Either way, James IV led the charge down the hill into the English front lines in a traditional medieval formation with his generals at the front, also known as the balls to the wall, no fucks given sort of strategy. It is very brave, and I am sure we all wish we still had leaders who, if they got us into conflicts, were still leading the front lines themselves. The English, however, performed what someone like Nate Diaz might call a bitch move, and a bitch move it was but it was also a technically sound one. And at the end of the day, I guess that is probably the metric we should judge nations on. Did it work on the day? Well, yes, yes it did. But I have sidetracked myself. I should explain the bitch move in question. The bitch move is generally overall tactically sound advice, which was to set up in a renaissance formation, positioning your generals at the back of your army to protect them so they can stay alive long enough to use the skills that were required for them to be a general and direct battle in the first place. Look, I'll never get bored of watching Justin Gaethje or Jorge Masvidal trying to fight everyone like they're in a phone box, but if at the end of the day it was a fight to the total death, the death of you, your people, and your culture, is it always worth fighting with that mentality and approach? As high as the stakes are in the UFC, it is not the same thing as conflicting nations. And as much as it pains me to say it, as I do love a good barn brawl, in the grand scheme of things, this was tactically the right move to make, not only for England, but the whole world in general. Which ultimately led us to where we are today. You could maybe argue this is part of the reason why no one ever went back to the medieval formations, and in a small way, possibly partially responsible for the disassociation of world leaders from their actions they execute today. Sorry, planet. So anyway, the Scottish army came crashing down the hill into the advancing English formations. We've already discussed the flaws like there's no going back so you better fight well, and by some accounts they did. Obviously overall the day didn't go well for Scotland, it would result in a crushing defeat and somewhere in the region of 3 to 10 times the amount of deaths as England would sustain. But it is nice to know that after the cannons stopped mowing through people like dandelions in a lawnmower, and the fighting got nice and intense that the English chronicler Edward Hall noted, the battle was cruel, none spared other, and the king himself fought valiantly. When the winner is right that you fought valiantly, you know damn well you did some moves that were worthy of that mention. Writing took time back then, and those who knew how to read or write were often busy doing other shit. But I digress. Following this charge, a fierce and bloody battle broke out during which the king was killed within arm's reach. And despite being quite the renaissance man himself, chose to leave this world like a good old-fashioned medieval king. Like how we all entered this world, covered in blood and screaming. Freedom, presumably, was not the last words James IV said as he took the final few heads off a few Englishmen as he died, but that's the image I've created in my head to help me deal with the fact that my country is still ruled by Westminster to this day, and the fact that we haven't been to a World Cup since 98. 
But no, I'm joking, of course. James IV is noted to have died by what appears to have been a lethal combination of a bill, think polearm, and an arrow. After that, it didn't take long before the lines of communications began to disintegrate. No one was left to effectively organize a retreat. But then again, to, to where? We just ran down a hill. We weren't going to get back up, so... Ultimately, all 17 of the Scottish cannons were captured, and again, it is nice to note that when the captured cannons made by Robert Borthwick of Edinburgh got to the Bishop of Durham, he thought of them as the finest he had ever seen. So again, I like to think when your enemy compliments your craftsmanship, especially over their own, that it has to mean something. I know, I know, it is a lot of small victories here, but what can I say? We lost, and at best, we killed 5,000 Englishmen for the cost of 20,000 Scots, but that is the best estimate given by one Italian newspaper of the time. A contemporary account produced by the Royal Postmaster of England stated not long after the battle that about 10,000 Scots were killed. But uh, it, it definitely wasn't as close as two Scots for one Englishman. This was because we did attempt to rout eventually after all our leaders had been killed, and at this point, even if it was two for one during the battle, as soon as it became a rout, it became a slaughter. So why do I love this miserable story of Scottish failure? Because we, as a species, learn from failure. The failures here influenced Britain for the next 500 years, as James IV would be the last, probably ever, British monarch to die in battle. Unless the Queen is planning something we don't know about, of course. I'm sure James IV moved forward valiantly, with all the grit, determination, and thirst for blood like any other Begbie following an American into a fringe festival toilet. If you ask me, this taught us that being brave doesn't always mean you will win. So what were the positives Scotland can take away from this? Well, this is why Scotland will lose to footballing nations you've never heard of, yet still turn up and try real hard when we play England. Truth be told, I don't think we ever really got over it. But there we go. The Battle of Flodden, Scotland's most disastrous assault on England. At some point, I'll have to come back with the Battle of Bannockburn. You know, just for balance. <laughs>